We're about to discuss one of the best science fiction movies of the 21st century, in my opinion, namely Inception by Christopher Nolan. Through this journey, I'll introduce you to the philosophical idea of authorial intent and shine a critical light on it. First, let me ask you this. Do you think he was still dreaming when he woke up at the end of the film? The reason I want to start with that question is that it brings up a crucial topic we must address before we can address anything else, and that is how to interpret art. Inception introduces us to Don Cobb, a man who utilizes the passive device, a portable automated somnolent intravenous device, to extract information from people's dreams. He has been prevented from seeing his children because he has been accused of killing his wife. But Saito, a businessman, makes Dom an offer he can't refuse. Saito will make the murder charge go away if Cobb pulls up a job for him. The task? Cobb will need to carry out an inception. He has to introduce an idea to Robert Fisher's mind. The idea is that Fisher ought to dissolve his father's enterprise. Cobb makes Fisher go through a series of layered dreams to achieve this, with time moving more slowly on each level than the one before it. We aren't really sure if Cobb has successfully returned to the real world and his children, even though the inception appears to be successful by the end, or if he is still trapped in a dream. At the very end of the movie, he does check his totem, a spinning top that serves as his method of separating reality from a dream. However, the screen goes black before we can see if the top topples over. It's an excellent way to cut to black just before the top falls. But one of the reasons why this movie is exceptional is that after watching it several times, you come to the realization that it doesn't really matter whether the top falls or not, because it doesn't in any way indicate whether Cobb is dreaming or not. First of all, totems only indicate whether you are in another person's dream. Cobb could consequently still be in his own dream, even if the top fell. Second, no one else must comprehend how your totem functions for it to be effective. But his late wife Mal was the original owner and architect of Cobb's totem. Also, Cobb's apprentice Ariadne, who created the dreams he is trying to flee from, is aware of how Cobb's totem functions. Third, because the logic of Cobb's totem is backwards, it cannot help anyone. In real life, a totem is supposed to be uncommon. When your token functions normally, you are aware that you are dreaming. But what do tops actually do in the real world? They fall. Cobb's totem is unique in the dream, but not in reality. If Cobb was in my dream, his top would fall if he spun it, because that's what tops do. So Cobb's totem is unable to provide any information about the nature of the world he is in. The absence of a cliffhanger in the conclusion, however, is what distinguishes Inception as a masterpiece. Because instead of being a cliffhanger, it's a magic trick. It's misdirection. To determine whether Cobb is still dreaming or not, you shouldn't be staring at the spinning top in the lower left corner of the screen. You should instead have been paying attention to what is being said by the characters in the upper right corner. To understand why, first keep in mind that a dreamer's subconscious may at times manifest itself in their dream world. In the dream with the kidnapping, the train wagon that kills Cobb and Mal puts them in limbo, reappears, and the number on it corresponds to the number of their hotel room, 3502. Speaking of numbers, 528491, the seemingly random string of numbers that Fisher utters in the kidnapping dream, actually corresponds to A. The phone number that the blonde haired woman gives Fisher, B. The hotel dream level's room number, and C. The code for the safe in the Snow Fortress dream level at the end of the movie. Cobb's subconscious also contains images of his kids, which recur frequently in the movie. Remember what happens when you leave Limbo, as Ariadne and Fisher do at the end of the movie? You'll notice that when they pass away in Limbo, they don't fully awaken in the real world. Simply put, they are sent back to the level at which they first entered Limbo. After awakening in the dream with the snow fortress, Fisher and Ariadne ride the kicks back up to the dream with the kidnapping. Keep in mind that Cobb and Saito first meet and then part ways in the dream world. In each instance, Cobb is paying a visit to Saito at his mansion. He resides in this extravagant residence on a cliff with a view of the sea. At this point in the movie, Cobb tries to persuade Saito to commit suicide to escape the dream limbo. So what is the hint you overlooked? While you were focused on the spinning top in the lower left of the screen, what occurred in the upper right? When Cobb asks his kids what they are up to, they respond that they are building a house on a cliff. 
So after leaving Limbo, did Saito and Cobb manage to return to the real world? Or did they, like Fisher and Ariadne, simply ascend to the now abandoned Snow Fortress dream level? Have they awoken in the real world? Or after coming out of Limbo, did Saito invent his own dream world? After emerging from Limbo, Cobb would have found himself in a dream world where he would have encountered aspects of Saito's subconscious such as his cliffside home. And think about this. How do we know that Cobb and Mal ever return to the real world from Limbo if dying in Limbo doesn't necessarily bring them back? However, Cobb claimed that they got to Limbo by experimenting with layered dreams. We see them waking up on an apartment floor but did they wake up in the dream they used to enter Limbo in the first place? Or is that apartment located in the real world? A dream inside a dream inside a dream that might after all go on for years. Maybe Mal's suspicions were correct after all. Perhaps they were still dreaming and she was awakened when she jumped out of the window. The whole film might be a dream. Perhaps this explains why Saito, Arthur, Eames, Ariadne, Yusuf and the other members of Dom's team only have first names. All of them are merely aspects of Cobb's subconscious. This could also explain why the city of Mombasa resembles a maze so much and why, as Cobb is being pursued, the walls of its buildings seem to close in around him. Perhaps for this reason, Eames can, as mentioned in the script, create poker chips out of thin air. Do you remember the song Cobb plays to indicate the end of the dream? Non je ne regrette rien by Edith Piaf. The original version lasts exactly 2 minutes and 28 seconds, and the film itself is precisely 2 hours and 28 minutes long. Also, why is Mal sitting in the window frame of another hotel room across the street from their own room when Cobb enters it, just before she seemingly jumps to her death? Inception is not an easy story to decipher, but we're going to have to find a way to analyze and understand this type of movie. Now it's common for people to invoke authorial intent in order to resolve such disputes. In literary theory and aesthetics, authorial intent refers to an author's intent as it is encoded in their work. Authorial intent or intentionalism is the view that an author's intention should constrain the ways in which a text is properly interpreted. What did Christopher Nolan himself believe took place in Inception? We could figure out how much of the movie was a dream if he would just tell us. The thing is, Nolan made it clear to everyone in an interview that while he made Inception with a particular interpretation in mind, he made it so it can be interpreted in many ways on purpose and that he will never reveal his intentions. Many of the motivations of many authors remain a mystery. The correct interpretation of many works on intentionalism must therefore inescapably remain unresolved. But what happens if the writer claims that the piece has no meaning? Similar to how J.R.R. Tolkien wrote The Lord of the Rings. Tolkien said the following, As for a message, I have none really, if by that is meant the conscious purpose in writing The Lord of the Rings, of preaching, or of delivering myself of a vision of truth specially revealed to me. I was primarily writing an exciting story in an atmosphere and background that I find personally attractive. Does this imply that there is no meaning to be found in The Lord of the Rings? Obviously not. It is filled with strong morals about friendship and of course the struggle between good and evil. Many people think of it as a commentary on the politics of Europe at the time of writing. The consequence of an intentionalist view is that the meaning of art becomes static and fixed by the author's intentions. But as society evolves around it, Art can acquire new meaning. A work of art's significance can indeed change as other works of art are created in response to it. I want you to think about the first Star Wars movie. Despite being a mainstay of science fiction, it has had a significant flaw for almost 40 years. Luke Skywalker was able to destroy the powerful Death Star by merely firing two proton torpedoes into an exhaust port due to a design flaw in the structure. It seems utterly absurd that it would be that easy. Rogue One, a prequel to the original Star Wars film, was released in 2016 and in it, it was revealed 
revealed that the Death Star's design flaw was actually intentionally created like this as an act of sabotage by the Death Star's creator, who had secretly plotted against the Empire for years. Many people think this fix is brilliant and will never view the first Star Wars in the same way. In actuality, Star Wars highlights a number of issues with the notion that authorial intent determines the meaning of art. The original creator of Star Wars, George Lucas, rethought the first Star Wars significance far too many times to count. He had not originally intended for Vader to be Luke's father. He altered Obi-Wan's crate dragon call and Aunt Beru's voice. He published a special edition later in the 1990s that changed some scenes and added new ones. Which part of Lucas' intentions is therefore supposed to reveal what actually occurred in the movie? What were his initial intentions, his subsequent goals and his ultimate goals? Intentionalism appears to downplay the significance of audience participation. The scene where the bounty hunter Greedo tracks down Han Solo is one of the most famous of Lucas' alterations. In the original, Han shot Greedo in the face, thereby killing him. In the special edition, Greedo fires a careless shot before before Han fires back. But despite Lucas's best efforts, the fans insisted that Han fired first and rejected the change. That's what made him so great. Ignoring the fan response would be equal to ignoring what philosopher George Dickey claims makes art art. He claims that the way art is displayed for an audience to appreciate and interpret is what makes it art. Declaring that Lucas's intentions alone settles the debate over who fired first would reduce Star Wars to nothing more than a self-produced collection of sounds and images. When you learn that different people contributed to the Star Wars saga as a whole, the situation worsens. Lucas had a huge crew working with him and numerous authors produced books and comics that in turn expanded the universe and Lucas regarded it all as canon. Disney subsequently rebooted the franchise and revised the canon, declaring everything except for the first six films and the Clone Wars cartoons to be mere legends after acquiring the rights in 2012. Which author is correct then? What actually occurred in the Star Wars world? Concerning intentionalism, it's difficult to say. The same objections apply when one insists that authorial intent is the ultimate authority on meaning, even though questions about canon are obviously somewhat different from questions about a film's meaning. The topic of authorial intent is still up for debate. Overall though, it will be most beneficial to reject intentionalism and follow philosopher Arthur Danto's method of interpretation. He contends that art, by its very nature, invites the viewer to interpret it and even complete it. Public is the nature of art. A work of art belongs to society once it is finished. And as such, everyone is welcome to interpret it however they see fit. Let's take a look at what is called the principle of charity. This principle suggests that we should try to understand ideas before criticizing them. Arguments should aim at finding the truth not necessarily winning the fight. So how is this relevant to analyzing movies? A sound interpretation cannot logically contradict the movie's core facts. You cannot ignore what actually occurred explicitly to support your preferred viewpoint. The principle of charity requires that you refrain from adopting an interpretation that makes the author of a particular work appear better or worse than they actually are. Both authorial intent and context are paramount. They aren't the final judges, even though both are useful. The Pianist, a film about a young Jewish man surviving the Holocaust, cannot, for example, be seen as a Nazi sympathizing film. All of this being said, we can now go back to discussing how to interpret Inception. Is everything that happens in Inception a dream? I believe the answer is yes, from start to finish. As we've seen, this theory wouldn't conflict with any of the movie's facts. Yes, Nolan left his interpretation open-ended on purpose, but more importantly, this interpretation enhances the movie. It is therefore the most charitable one. The real world in the movie is kind of hollow, if it is actually the real world. Cobb is the only multifaceted character. Everyone else is flat. They are only there for Cobb's convenience and lack any external motivation. The characters in good movies usually have depth, 
So it's brilliant if the one-dimensionality of the characters served as a subliminal hint that Cobb has been dreaming the entire time. In one scene, Dom is watching his father-in-law from outside a classroom, when all of a sudden he is inside the room talking to his father-in-law. If Cobb is dreaming, these cuts make perfect sense. But if this happens in the real world, that's just careless editing. As a tiny subliminal hint that Cobb is dreaming though, it is a stroke of genius. Even the writing is subpar, as when Saito appears in Mombasa to save Cobb completely out of the blue. Cobb says, what are you doing in Mombasa? And Saito responds, I need to protect my investments. Really? That is absurd. What is the probability that Cobb's beneficiary just appears out of the blue to be his savior? Let's just say slim to none. But dreams on the other hand, often involve events of this nature. Naturally some will assert that if the entire film is a dream, that makes matters worse. Because then nothing actually occurs. Everything is just a dream. The thing is though, that it is a movie. Regardless of whether it is a dream, nothing actually occurs. Why should we care less about a dream based film, when other fictional works are just as compelling? This results in a phenomenon known as the paradox of fiction. How come we care? Why do we feel things when we read fiction, even though we are fully aware that it is fiction? Why does it matter if Cobb returns to his kids, when neither he nor his kids are real people? These two monsters running down a hallway are seemingly completely different sizes, but in actuality, they are the exact same size. In spite of the fact that I can compare the two monsters to show that they are in fact the same size, my brain will continue to perceive them as being different from each other. Your visual center in the brain has a section that is essentially unaffected by your rationality. What you see is unaffected by what you know, similar to how your emotional center is immune to the knowledge that a movie is fiction. Even though you rationally understand that it is not happening, you will still respond to it as if it were. This concept is essentially why I think think that Inception is truly a masterpiece. At the end of the movie, after Cobb spins his top, he turns away from his totem when he hears his children. Therefore, we could infer that Cobb doesn't care if he's dreaming anymore. He's made the decision to stop worrying about it and just accept that he is awake. If so, the lesson might be that genuine knowledge is irrelevant. Just make the decision to believe whatever you want to believe. Even though that this makes for a compelling and thought-provoking ending, a true philosopher should never be content with this. The pursuit of objective truth is the ultimate goal for philosophers. If you do not listen, then I hell with you. But that's the thing. For a movie to be a masterpiece, it doesn't necessarily need to be right concerning its message. It just needs to make you reflect on something truly interesting. In this case, I personally disagree with the message. Philosophers should constantly question and challenge their own beliefs and ideas in order to arrive at a deeper understanding of the truth. Only by doing so can we truly embody the essence of philosophy and science. And in the end, we should all strive to be philosophers. The discussion of authorial intent concerning the interpretation of art often turns into a heated debate. The movie Inception is a great example of how the director's intentions can be interpreted in different ways. Although some may argue that the author's intent is the ultimate authority on a work's meaning, this view may downplay the significance of audience participation and ignore the evolving nature of society. Instead, we should in my opinion embrace philosopher Arthur Danto's view that art is completed by the viewer and that it belongs to society once it is created. Therefore, we should continue to interpret and reinterpret art as it can provide us with new meanings and insights that can inspire us and give us hope, especially in our moments of doubt and despair. Yet it is of great importance to remember and honor the principle of charity. I really hope you liked the video and want to support the channel with that thumbs up and by subscribing. And if you want to learn more about one of Christopher Nolan's primary sources of inspiration when making Inception, then check out my videos about The Matrix. Until next time, stay curious.